Before I turn things over to uh, our audience to ask questions, you came back to the theater. What made you come back to Chicago and to Bob Falls? Well, I never left the theater. I mean, what, I, what was interesting about my career, which is totally different from most people's career, is that being in the movies allowed me to do in the theater parts that I wanted to do. I never got to do those parts before I became a kind of a half-assed movie star. <laughs> And because I became a half-assed movie star, all of a sudden people said, well, let, let's get him, you know, it's like Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> <laughs> let's get her on stage. In fact, I have a producer a couple of weeks ago said, uh, what about that crap stuff tape? What are you going to do? What are you gonna do with that? I said, well, I'm going to do it at New Haven. Why? He says, I'm thinking about getting Scarlett Johansson to do that part. What do you think? <laughs> no, that's a joke. But, uh, <laughs> but it illustrates a point notwithstanding. <laughs> Anyway, I got, I got to play great parts because I had been in the movies and been in television, ironically. But the theater was something that I never... Bob and I met. I was doing a play at a small theater in the north side of Chicago called Wisdom Bridge. And by the way, Chicago is, with all due respect to Toronto and New York City, Chicago is the great city of the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> and I'm not even a Chicagoan. Okay, I, li I still live in and around New York, but Chicago is the place. And when it comes to theater, uh, the energy and the yeast and the explosiveness and the, and the rage and the fun that comes out of that place is just unbelievable, the best. In any case, Bob and I met. I was doing a play by a wonderful playwright named Ron Hutchinson called Rat in the Skull, and it's about Northern Ireland wonderful play. I, this was the second of his plays that I'd done. In fact, Nick Woodison, who I had done Says I, Says He with in Los Angeles, that's a Ron Hutchinson play, Irish play again. Nick is just finishing up doing Max in Homecoming at Stratford in England. <laughs> so he and I have traded some very interesting phone calls. Mm -hmm. And Nick's coming over to see the uh, last couple of performances of our show. Any case, Bob and I started uh, doing plays at the Goodman Theater. First thing we did was Galileo, a hard play. I mean, that's the great thing about working with Bob. Uh, you know, we would try to we would try to out guess each other as to how difficult we could make it <laughs> for ourselves. I think the second play we did was uh, um, the O'Neill play, uh, the poet. Uh, what is Touch it? Of the poet. Touch of the poet. Very hard play. We then did Iceman Cometh, even harder. <laughs> and we did Iceman in Ireland, uh, as well as Chicago, had a ball with it. And we've done really, really hard plays. And then it culminated in him calling me up saying, I want to do uh, Death of a Salesman. And I said, I don't know, everybody knows that play. And he says, you know, not everybody knows that play. And which is true. You know, people think that they know the play, but they don't. You know, it turns out that people came in and saw the play and said, you know, I really didn't see it before. So that was a big hit, and Long Day's Journey was a big hit. And But the point is that being in the movies in those years allowed me to do these other things, and uh, they took on a life of their own, um, and which is how I wound up here, which is this place, uh, Stratford, is the best theater company in the world. Without, without, uh, without any, um, what's the word, without any sense of rancor, I can say that I'm the 10th or 12th best actor in that company. There are nine or ten people of both sexes who are way ahead of me. And that's the truth. I, this not, I'm not making that up. That's, believe me, I know that. <laughs> because I know actors. I, I've, I've watched them for years. And there are, you know, in my, the plays alone that I'm doing, there are three or four actors who I, I, know, I, I, I couldn't hold their jock. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it, you've got to cherish this institution as Canadians. 
You better appreciate it. You better understand it and appreciate what you have because it doesn't exist anyplace else. And it's fragile. It's easily broken. So don't break it. It's very, very special. Let's open up to uh, the audience. If we have any questions for Mr. Dennehy, please come to the microphone, if we can, because we'd like to get them recorded, OK? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, you said that working with Peter, it was Peter Greenaway, um, you weren't entirely sure what he meant. Having just seen the homecoming, I'm not entirely sure what Mr. Pinter meant. <laughs> you played a character who, among others, told many versions of the same story. It was very difficult to find, for me to find any truth in it. And I wondered how you c could approach playing Max, who, who doesn't seem to be, who doesn't seem to have any background story that we usually find in people. So how did you approach it? Well, um, <laughs> I could give you a, a Pinter's response uh, to, Pinter did a lot of directing, and um, when an actor asked him, as certainly I would have, had he been directing, what, what is, Mr. Pinter, you wrote this play and you're directing it, what, is this, what does this mean? And Pinter's response was, none of your fucking business, learn, <laughs> just learn the lines. <laughs> Uh, the thing is this, when you saw, let me ask you a question, when you saw this play, while you were seeing the play, when you got up and walked out of the play, did you feel uncomfortable and disturbed? That's the point. <laughs> if you want to know what the point is, that's the point. Also, the point. <laughs> now, that's a, that's a, well, yeah. my, my approach is, ultimately my approach was to attack the audience as hard as I could. My point, what my, the point, the thing that I tried to do was to make you all feel as uncomfortable and as nasty and as unclean as I could. Because that was his point. And the reason for all of that is, if you understand anything about Pinter, is that that's what Pinter sees as his job, to disturb you. You come in, you sit down, we're going to see a play. Homecoming, it's about Thanksgiving. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's not about Thanksgiving. Uh, and it's not about homecoming, and it's not even about home. It's, it's, about, it's about not having any areas in the world including home, including any place, including in the theater, that are safe. None. There is no safe place. There is no safe, there's no place that can make you feel, I don't have to worry about anything here. Even the theater, even a place that you pay 120 bucks for to sit down <laughs> and be entertained can piss you off and make you feel disturbed and upset and confused and come out saying, what the hell was that all about? That's what it's about. I don't know if that's an answer, but it's the only one I got. <laughs> Great, thank you. Great. Next question. Okay, I'm an O'Neill program. Perhaps you could sign later. If, if that's a, I'm an O'Neill program you could sign later, if that's okay. Okay. Now, now, now you... Of course, a great O'Neill actor. You played um, virtually every role that Jason Robards played, with exception, I guess, of James Tyrone Jr. and Moonfall and Miss Begotten. Oh, I didn't play Junior. I played James Tyrone Senior. I played Senior and, and but the, Robards. And actually, Robards played uh, Jamie Junior, which I was always too old to play. But, okay, uh, so he not played. Well, he was fairly old when he played it opposite Christine Colin Dewhurst, wasn't he? Anyway, my question is this. Um, um, You've played Theodore Hickman in the past, and Theodore Hickman, of course, affects everyone in the play. Let it be a forthcoming production, and Nathan Lane will be playing him, and you'll be playing Larry Slade, who perhaps only affects one person, but the young boy who commits suicide, um, probably 
because of, of his discussions with Larry Slade. So it's not like um, Othello and Iago, where you have two equal parts. Um, Larry Slade is not as important as Theodore Hickman, which he played in part. So how do you feel playing the second most important Well, first of all, I don't agree with that. <laughs> Larry, Larry Slade... Uh, Larry Slade's a much more complicated character than that. Larry Slade, it's not, his relationship with the young boy is not just that. You forget that Slade was a union organizer, a guy who believed in, O'Neill refers to it as the movement, the revolution. This is now taking place in 1910, 1912 on the, on the lower uh, west side of Manhattan. Actually, Jimmy the Priest Bar was on the site of the World Trade Center you know, 50, 60 years before. Uh, and he has become thoroughly disillusioned with the possibility of world revolution. And he's sitting in this bar as the rest of these people are essentially drinking himself to death, just waiting to die. Um, but when he speaks out of his rage and out of his fury and out of his darkness and his frustration with the life that he's led and the hopelessness of what his struggle was, you feel inescapably the humanity of the man, the huge decency of the man. The fact that even with Hick Hickey or Hickman, he at some point understands what a tortured uh, person he is. And the boy, I mean, the, the wonderful thing about O'Neill's writing, especially of Larry Slade, is that he, he has Larry Slade saying constantly, I hate the world. I hate everybody in it. I have no understanding or patience or room for sympathy for anyone in the world anymore. I, you know, everybody to me is worthless, is useless. And he does not mean a word of it. So the responsibility of the actor is to accomplish both those things, to say those words, at the same time to communicate the fact that he doesn't mean it. If anything, he's the most sympathetic character on the stage. And, and his heart, however broken it may be, is the biggest and fullest and most bleeding heart on the stage. It's a huge demand upon the actor. And... Um, probably the most difficult part in the play, for all the reasons that I've just mentioned. And so it, it's not necessarily the size of the part, it's the, it's the size of the role, it's the size of the responsibility. Now what, the, the real fact of the matter is, I'm too old to play Hickey. Nathan Lane's a huge star. He wants to take it on, and he and I have been friends for a long time, and he wants me to play the part. And I'm lucky to be there. As I said to Stephen Wimet, who's going to play Harry Hope, I said, Stephen, got to be in the room. <laughs> you got to be in the room. We're lucky. We're all of us lucky because we're going to spend six weeks in Chicago in the spring being in this room, 15 or 20 of us, and we're going to get to explore this play with this amazingly talented man, uh, Nathan Lane, and a whole bunch of other talented people doing one of the hardest plays ever written. And that's why I do this, for that to happen. So, aside from the fact that I don't agree with anything you said, <laughs> I hope I've answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yes, next question, please. Hi, Brian. Um, as with a lot of great people, um, through life lessons and uh, wisdom acquired through uh, their life, they can distill all that into one piece of advice. Um, what advice would you have to give? And how did you learn this lesson? Who taught you this? I'm not exactly sure how to answer that. <laughs> I would say this, um, as I say to my kids, uh, repeatedly, there is nothing more interesting and fulfilling in life ever than work, whatever that work is. Now, 
Can there be jobs that are not fulfilling and boring? Sure, but you don't have to do them. I did every damn boring-ass job you can do. I drove trucks, I worked as a bartender, I worked as a waiter, but everything that I did was always kind of fun. It was always kind of interesting. It's really the point of view. But eventually I got my way around to this. And uh, I'm 73, and you know, people say to me all the time, when the hell are you gonna quit? Jesus Christ, why would I quit? <laughs> you know, I, I, since the time I can remember, I grab, I've grabbed my life like, like a mango, and I've mashed it into my throat, and, and just rubbed the juice all over my face. Why would anybody else live any differently? Now, I've drank too much, I've screwed around too much, I, I, at one time I went through stuff with sailboats, and I sailed across the Pacific by myself, I sailed the Atlantic by myself, whatever it was, whatever it was that I wanted to do, I did, and I did it as hard and as tough and as uncompromisingly as possible. And most of all, it's the work. It's going to Chicago on March 12th, starting rehearsals. I'm being in the room trying to figure something out, something that was written 50, 60 years ago, but which, which still has meaning and blood and semen and sweat in it, and the, the chance to reproduce it all over again. It's life. You know, I've lived a life. I mean, I wish I had more time, but boy, I don't, I don't regret any of it, and I didn't waste any of it. Ever. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. I've seen you in a number of numerous movies, but I didn't realize how good an actor you were until I actually saw you on stage. <laughs> so, as a theater goer and a, and a great fan. I'll take of, that as a compliment. <laughs> absolutely. I think. Absolutely. Um, as, a, as a theater goer and a great fan of. of Stratford stage, um, you know, thank you for, for bringing your great talent to Stratford. Between, between you and Christopher Plummer, you guys have revived Stratford. So thank you for that. You guys, uh, you have in Stratford, you have Tom Rooney, and you have Ben Carlson, and you have Stephen Wimette, and you have Sarah Topham, and you have Lynn, uh, Peacock, Lucy and Liz Peacock and Shauna McKenna. I mean, you, have, you got a, a menu of talent down there and directors and technicians. If you had a chance to ever go down backstage and see where they make the costumes and where they make the wigs and the people who are so dedicated 